Europlanet is one of Europe's largest research consortiums looking at planetary sciences. With 13 host institutions, they offer over 20 facilities under their research infrastructure that you can apply for to enhance your research. Now I'm here at the Open University to look at just one of those facilities and see what it has to offer that could enhance your research for the future of planetary science. So I'm here at the Open University NanoSims Laboratory to meet Ian Frankie, the lead scientist here, and he's going to show us just how you can measure things at the sub-micron scale. Hello, Ian. Hi. I won't shake your hand because you've got gloves on for a reason. Hi, well, welcome to the NanoSims lab at the Open University. So this laboratory can really analyse things down at the sub-micron scale. So yeah. Before we actually go and look at the machine and how it works, can you show me a little bit about the samples? What sort of things can you analyze in it and how do you have to prepare them? We can analyze a very wide range of geological and planetary materials or biological samples, uh, material samples, uh, so any, be... anything that's compatible with uh, going inside a, a good vacuum system. So anything from a meteorite, comet dust, to even experimental uh, vacuum yeah. material, yeah. And biological samples as well. Okay. And what sort of uh, scales and, and, and sample preparation needs to be done? Well, this instrument is very demanding on its sample requirements. Right. The samples have to be very flat, very good polish on them, uh, if possible. Um, they have to be uh, round samples, and I have a sample holder here, which oh, shows wow. um, the types of uh, samples we like to have. These are on 10 millimeter round uh, discs. Is that gold on the top These there? These are gold coated. The samples have to be electrically uh, conducting, so if they're insulators naturally, we put a gold coat or a carbon coat on them. Right. Um, we can also take larger samples in 12 and a half millimeter rounds, or even one inch, that's 25.4 millimeter rounds. But all of them have to be round, and how, how thick does the sample have to be to well, be able to be mounted? We can take samples up to about seven millimeters thick. Um, so for anyone sample. wanting to come to use the laboratory, some of those key measurements which will be on the website are, uh, are vital in terms of pre-sample preparation before coming here to maximise what they get out of a machine which, which must cost quite a lot to run per day. It, it's a lot of effort and a lot of cost to keep this machine running. Um, we do like to maximise the, the time we do have on it when it's working. Um, and also, we don't want people turning up here with samples that we can't put in the instrument. Exactly, yeah. I mean, we can accommodate other samples. There's an example here of a, a much smaller sample held behind a grid, which also has to be flat and polished, but uh, you end up with this very small area. That, that, that obviously analyze. limits what you can yeah. do with the sample. And there's another example here of uh, we can take very fine uh, small dust particles and press them into gold. Obviously, they don't end up quite as flat or as, as a polished sample, but uh, for some sample types of analysis, that's yeah. plenty good enough. Excellent, so now we've got our samples ready to go and be analysed, they're on the mount. How do we get this mount in the machine? Should we go and have a look? Okay. Wow, here it is. <laughs> so, we have a series of vacuum chambers to accept the sample. It takes a few hours to load the sample in at the minimum. Uh, it starts off with an airlock sample here. The sample is simply mounted in here. secured up and we can do the first stage pump down uh, very quickly. So that's now becoming a vacuum. We actually yeah. see, you can see the sample sample in there, can't yeah. you? Ready to go. So after a couple of hours we can move it into here and we've already got sample ready uh, in the analysis chamber across here. Okay, so how, how do I, so how do you actually get the sample from here into, into these bits? Do you... well, so we can secure the sample okay. uh, and push it onto the loading arm lock it on and then we can move it into this once we've opened that gate valve. Brilliant. Okay, so so essentially this, this is all done under vacuum. So you've got the sample here, moved in, then loaded into the area where it's going to be analysed. So what happens there? What's actually, what's actually going on in the machine to give you some analysis? Well, the sample is sitting in here in the middle of this chamber. And what we do is we take a, a primary iron beam from up here and it's rastered onto the sample surface. This actually knocks off pieces of the sample surface generating secondary ions. 
These are then extracted into the mass spectrometer system along here, and then across through the magnetic field onto the detector array, which is along here. Here we have seven detectors that we can move to detect uh, specific samples as specific elements or specific isotopes of the same elements to build up not just element maps, but also isotope ratio maps. And the ability of this instrument to generate submicron uh, resolution image maps of uh, isotopic ratios is a unique thing that nanosims can do. So that makes this nanosims a very special piece of kit. If you want that kind of data, you have to come here to get it. Yes. So this is the machine. You can see all the pipes. Everything's going to be blasting and, 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 and measuring from here. Where's the engine room? How's it actually operating? Well, the control station's just down here. There's uh, a lot of controls on this machine to set up for each analysis. Um, in most instances, uh, the analysis will be supported by an operator rather than uh, users coming in and using the machine themselves. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I guess some background training was needed to, to know what to do. Um, we can view the sample. We've got a reasonably good uh, optical microscope to see oh, where right. we are. Um, so here's a, the field of view is about four or five hundred microns across. These are some volcanic, uh, lunar volcanic glasses. Oh, so this uh, is something from the moon? Yes. Oh, fantastic. But you get a, a feel for the quality of the optical image you've got. And actually one of the big challenges people bringing samples to this instrument is finding the areas they want to analyze. Mm. So you've got to come in with uh, well characterized samples that you know what you want to analyze down to a few microns. Right. But we've got to find those areas primarily with the optical uh, image here. So are people able to prepare um, sort of maps of their own images, images of their own samples prior to coming to it, help it, that process? It's absolutely essential that people have optical images, optical maps of their samples uh, in reflected light because that's what we've got here. And if they've got secondary uh, electron microscope uh, images, they need to provide secondary electron images and not just backscatter images as uh, the geo world. Uh, tends to do. Uh, backscatter images tell us very little about the surface, which is what we see here with the optical yeah, microscope. So Second electron images. Right, okay. And so what are some of the real, I mean this is clearly a world-class institute that's able to produce, you know, fantastic data really down to small measurements in these small areas. What, what are some of the key research highlights that, that maybe you've been involved with or, or that the facility's been involved with over the years? Well, we've been doing a lot of work the last few years on looking at the volatile inventory of the lunar interior. Um, one of the big challenges uh, was understanding how the, moon, how the moon's formed. We talked about a giant impact event uh, coming from the, the, uh, the Earth's interior and, and a large impact event. But when we started looking at the, the hydrogen that's found inside the interior of the moon, it had a delta uh, hydrogen isotope composition that was very different to the Earth's interior. Oh, right. Um, almost double the amount of deuterium relative to the, the protons. And that, and that was, was only able, you're only able to get that data by using it well, on this other, machine. Others have discovered that, but one of the one of the work we've done is established that these very unusual signatures are the result of degassing. And actually, the interior of the moon is much more like the interior of the Earth. And when these rocks are erupted onto the surface, a lot of degassing as they're transported to the surface of the moon, and that's fractionating the hydrogen acid composition. So yes, at the end of the day, the interior of the moon doesn't like the interior of the Earth. Wow. Okay. In terms of volatiles. So we're working with the very surface of the sample. So what it has to do first with every analysis is do some cleaning of the surface. Uh, this one's largely prepared, so just did a short uh, pre-sputter, we call it, to clean the surface material off. Okay. Uh, even at very high vacuum, uh, there's still contamination ends up in the surface that this machine is sensitive to. So here we're measuring the chlorine isotope composition, which is another volatile from the interior of the moon that we're interested in, as well as looking at the, the hydrogen abundance, the fluorine abundance. So we have a wide range of standards in this laboratory, but again, if people are coming in to do things that we have not got previous experience of doing, uh, it's very beneficial if they can bring their own standards with them. Right. Okay. And we again, can, the standards have to be in the same uh, type of uh, circular samples that, that can be analysed. Ideally in the 10 millimetre rounds, which you can help uh, guide how these should be prepared. 
um, because then we can load lots of 10 millimeter rounds. If they're in one inch rounds, we can only load one at a time. And so there's the, a, a range of different elements that you're measuring there. And what sample size is that? This is on a three micron spot. A three micron spot. So that's really, really going down to fine, fine detail, isn't it? Well, that's critical for your looking at these volatiles. Samples are covered in cracks and pits and other features. Um, you've, actually, finding a good area to analyze can be very challenging. And that's one of the beauties about this instrument, is it can go down to these very small spot sizes and find areas that are exactly what we want to analyze without contaminating phases or contamination. So we've got some data collecting there. How would a user get that information uh, for themselves to use back, back in their own, own institution? They can have the raw data files, but we process the data into Excel spreadsheets here. Right. And they can take those away with them until all the data is processed. So there's a specific kind of spreadsheet file for it. Yeah, so we, that's all set up already for many analysis. And what about these, these uh, special element maps you talked to me about? H how would they get that information? Well, we use a bespoke software package that's on this workstation across oh, here. Okay. So this is a uh, Lamage software that we provided to us from uh, the people in Carnegie and Washington. Um, it's a specific package uh, for really tailored for looking at planetary and geological materials. So this right. is sort of ideal for the types of materials that we've been analyzing as part of your planet. And what do you have up here? You've got various colors, uh, so, a sort of map of something. This particularly allows us to do isotope ratio maps. Um, and here we've got the three isotopes of oxygen ratioed against each other. There's 1716 and 1816 uh, ratios uh, of this about 10, 12 micron uh, dust particle from a comet that was collected in the stratosphere. Oh, wow. So we can see isotopic so variation. That's really two microns. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so we've got isotope, isotopic information at the pixel uh, scale down at the 100 nanometers or so. Wow. And so we can start looking for isotopic anomalies or variations between different grains uh, down at that sort of resolution. And we can also do element ratio, so we've got a silicon oxygen ratio here, so we can look for oxides or uh, silicate grains, for instance, or look for magnesium rich grains or iron rich grains, depending on which elements we've got set up on the actual mm. machine. So, researchers can get everything from detailed spot analysis to images that they could use. I mean, you could use that in, in a publication yes, directly to, yes. to highlight to someone the spatial distribution of certain isotopes and elements in their really small samples. So, this is actually very specialist software. So you can take away the actual processed images, you can take away the, the uh, raw uh, image files from the instrument, although this software is rather expensive, but there are free packages that can be downloaded off the internet. Maybe not quite as refined as this for geological materials, but uh, you can process them at home, wow. back at your home lab. So within Europlanet, this particular facility provides almost a unique chance to get some of this, yeah. this type of data. Well, that's really quite fascinating. Thank you, Ian. So if you want to apply to use this NanoSIMS or any of the other facilities in the 13 institutions in Europlanet, you can follow the link on the website. And good luck.